Hopefully no blow ups. <laughs> uh, I was I was listening to the a book, an audio book called The Founders, which is all to do with Elon's initial story with PayPal and um, X.com and SpaceX and that whole journey. I don't know if you guys have ever listened to it or, or read yeah. it before, but I, I would recommend that's really good. I, I like audio books, get through a lot more of them that way. So I've just started um, David Goggins's uh, oh, audio yeah, book. Man. Yeah, I've, I've watched, I've listened to all of his Joe Rogan episodes, the three of them, and now it's like the 12 and a half hour audio book. I've, uh, yeah, started to get the, the teeth into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a commitment, but I mean, you know, you always get little snippets. And uh, yeah, I like to like take notes on my iPhone or whatever it is as I'm going along, like little, little, uh, little gems <laughs> from time to time to try and share them with the broader teams. You have to, mate. Otherwise, you just forget about it. Like I'm, I'm a big note taker as well. It's like you, you hear something and you don't, you don't write it down or share it. It's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. It's like I know that reading books is better for attention, but yep. just struggle so hard like to to actually ha- find a time to get through it. Yeah, it just has to be on the car or when you're commuting or you know something like that. Um, on holidays, good too, in the plane. How do you do it, Matt? You know, the amount of content you're probably consuming would be just ridiculous. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've gone off the books rec- like in, in recent years, really. Um, it's, more just, it's more just blog posts. I, a lot of the podcasts I'll listen to. Um, and yeah, I'll bump up, bump up the speed a bit. If it's something like new, like I'll, I'll keep it on just like, you know, one, one time. So it's for that retention, as Tommy said. Yeah. Um, but yeah, otherwise in my downtime, it's just all forms of content I just kind of throw out and just <laughs> just try to do IRL sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's no right and wrong way to do it. It's just like whatever works best for the individual, I, right? Like same with, <laughs> same with investing. We might even talk about that tonight as well. Yeah. yeah. It's, been, um, it's been pretty flat though, everything, um, markets-wise. I think the PayPal announcement moved us to the, maybe a percent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was going to have a bit more of an impact. I mean, it's it's pretty it's big news, right? Like just considering the amount of value and reach that PayPal has, it's uh yeah, I thought it was going to have much bigger impact, I guess. But I guess in saying that, I thought the ETF announcement was going to have a lesser impact, even though yeah, it had it had quite an impact, I guess in the, in hindsight. Um but yeah, everything has definitely cooled off since then. Yeah, it's meaningfully boring, I think, for most people. I think everyone sort of uh, disappeared. Although I was, I was at the barber today, I got a haircut, and, and one of the barber was saying that she she uh, she buys her meat through, her like a butcher, through Telegram and through Bitcoin. She pays for her, for her steaks through a Telegram chat with some butcher that he, she pays in Bitcoin. Huh. <laughs> Is she, sure, so, is, she so sure it's, is she sure it's beef? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what. I've never heard of that. Oh, that's, I've never wow. heard of that. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. There you go. There's a use case right there. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, well, there you go. You can buy your meat through a, through a Telegram chat uh, to a butcher. <laughs> yeah. I thought you'd be all over that, Matt. You're, um, you're always looking for use cases, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a new one. I'll add, I'll add it to the list. Um, sure. That's a very, uh, that's a very, you know, five, six, seven years ago sort of use case of Bitcoin. Good to hear they're still out there. Yeah, I didn't get a proper chance to ask her like why, but I think she said something about she just wanted to support um, the Bitcoin network. And I was like, well, wow, well done. <laughs> and you proceeded, you proceeded to pay with uh, Australian dollars. I proceeded to pay in dirty fiat and yeah. my dirty credit card surcharge <laughs> that they charged me. <laughs> How dare you? How dare yeah, you do uh... something? <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, we're getting closer. Every week, every month, we're getting closer to better solutions. So, you know, we just got to stick mm. with it. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit more time. That's it, Matt. Exactly right. And how about the, the Lions, Tommy? What, what are you thinking coming into the finals, mate? Hopefully, um, we keep the keep the train on track. Yeah, look, a bit of form. A bit of form is always good this time of season. A few, few hard fought out games but you know getting the w at the end of the day so yeah look it's it's i think collingwood is still the form team and all they've kind of gone off the boil for the last few weeks but yeah people are you 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 wouldn't serve yourself well to write them off at this stage but um 
yeah, I guess anything can happen in the final. Double chance is what you want, which the Lions, I think, should get now and Collingwood as well. So it's good. Yeah. I think um, Carlton might be the dark horse this year, perhaps. Oh, I just don't want to believe it. If any, <laughs> any Carlton fans, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, that'd be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it would make for a good grand final, though. Collingwood, a Collingwood and Carlton grand final, or a, mm. you know, two Melbourne teams in the grand final it hasn't happened for a while. So I'd be, um, yeah, it'd be good yeah. to see that happen. It would be huge. Yeah. Uh, so will you be, will you be attending, Ben? Uh, if the Lions make finals, I will be, mate. Um, actually, in saying that, most of October, I'm I'm actually not here now I think about it. Um, yeah, so probably not. Unless we make the grand final, I'll be back for. So if I think if you make the grand final, you'll have to make a special appearance. Straight, straight through the, uh, to, to the, to the, the top, mate. I'll be, uh, I'll be there for a, a grand final. I'm still uh, held on to my membership, mate, in hope that we, yeah. uh, we might, we might sneak in. No, that's what you want. Cool. All um, right. Are we kicking it off? Yeah, we might kick off. Where are we? 601. Awesome. Fantastic. Let's kick off. So thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, if you have any questions throughout, please leave them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, we've got a pretty awesome show tonight uh, with some quality sort of insights and tactics uh, and really just lining you up to prepare for the upcoming bull market that we think is going to be coming hopefully pretty soon. Um, so we're going to be walking through some investment strategies and tactics. Uh, but as always, before we kick off, I just need to uh, shout out a quick disclaimer. Uh, so this webinar is for general information purposes only, and the information presented is not advice and does not take into account your personal situation. If you're looking to get advice, please seek out the help of a licensed financial advisor. References to past performance is not indicative of future performance, and SwiftX do not recommend any particular asset or investment strategy. Bit of housekeeping, tick that off. And really, team, for those that are tuning in tonight, you're going to walk away at the end of this masterclass with a crypto strategy that we believe could be the difference between winning and losing in the crypto cycle. And we say that because 90% of people going into crypto markets don't tend to have a strategy. They tend to, tend to go in blind. We've all been there. Usually the first cycle, uh, you know, if you've only been through one cycle, you probably didn't have a strategy. I know I definitely didn't. Uh, and, you know, what we're going to walk away with tonight is, is stuff that we've been sharing with our um you know, our members and our clients for a little while now that to help them prepare and, and, and take the emotion out of investing. And, you know, the reason we're doing this tonight is historically, um, these cycles come in in four years and it lines up with the, the Bitcoin halving. And you want to get this sorted in these bear markets because once the bull market hits, it's usually too late. Now, who is this masterclass for? This is for more intelligent crypto investors. So those that are wanting to make a million dollars overnight or get into the latest meme coin, you know, we don't, uh, we don't share those um, sorts of insights. We're here to really help serious investors who want to build long-term wealth in crypto, finding good assets um, and investing in for the long-term is what we're about. And primarily the the content in tonight's session is going to help most people between the $10,000 portfolio range up to the million dollar portfolio sizes. If you're outside of those ranges, it still will be helpful, but primarily if you're within that, uh, that range, it's going to be best suited for you. And if you're not currently feeling confident about your strategy, tonight's going to give you a bit more confidence about how to actually create a strategy. Uh, we're going to walk you through the process that we have um, tonight that you can actually get a notepad and pen out and create yourself. If you don't have the time to do all the work yourself, we're going to give you some insights and tactics so you can really get ahead of the market um, in the hour we have with you tonight. And if you don't have that proper knowledge or you're just sick of following the bad advice online, tonight we're going to give you some real quality, you know, research-backed, unbiased insights um, because we so, so, see so many people following um, some of the stuff online and, and it's pretty pretty ordinary um, sort of information and most people get led down the garden path. So, you know, if you want to really understand when to get in and out of the market, you want to create that strategy, you want to have that knowledge, we're going to share all of that with you tonight. Um, and also, uh, by the end of the masterclass, uh, Matt, our head of research, is going to share with you three altcoin sectors that we've identified that have significant growth potential, um, areas that we're looking to invest in for the upcoming halving. Um, and anyone that wants to upgrade their portfolio and just learn a little bit more about what we do here at Collective Shift, we do have an offer for you at the end. Completely no obligation if you don't want that. We're just going to have that there for those that are interested that will come right at the end as well as a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please hold on to those and we'll get to those at the end. Um, and the other thing, a lot of the information we're going to share with you tonight is stuff that isn't necessarily shared online. And we know this because we speak to so many investors that come to us from listening to people online and are buying bad old coins. They don't have a strategy. They're not really sure what's going on. Um, and, and it's purely because a lot of the content online you see might be entertaining content, but it's not necessarily research backed. So tonight we're going to share with you a lot of information that isn't necessarily shared online so you can have the edge in the market. 
Now, who on, uh, who on earth am I? My name is Ben Simpson. Um, so I'm the founder of Collective Shift. Uh, we are a crypto research and insights platform. We've been working with SwiftX now for, oh, I don't know how long, probably nearly a year now, Tommy. Yep. Um, and uh, we're super passionate about just helping educate everyday investors. So we know that there's this space is going to be huge. It already is growing so rapidly. And there's a real lack of where we feel there's a real lack of quality information out there. And we've been really lucky to work with SwiftX and um, put on masterclasses like these tonight. Um, how I got into crypto? Well, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. My first real company was a sportswear apparel company. I manufactured garments out of China and Pakistan. And one of the issues was sending uh, cash overseas was, as we all know, the uh, the exchange rates and the time it takes to send money overseas is, is a lot. And it's very time consuming and it was a real issue for my business. So I started looking into alternative currencies. And it's how I discovered Bitcoin back in 2017. Unfortunately, the, the, the factory didn't want to accept Bitcoin. Um, but I went down the path of, of getting involved in crypto and it really took me um, down the rabbit hole and I've been passionate about it for the last seven years. Been buying pretty much every week. Here's me back in 2017. We, were, we went around the country and were educating people around Bitcoin. Um, completely different times back then, back in the ICO days. Uh, but uh, educating people about Bitcoin and crypto has been a real passion of, of mine. And I was lucky enough to do a TEDx talk last year on cryptocurrencies and digital assets and um, yeah, really pushing the narrative of why why this space is important and why you need to know about it. Uh, with us tonight as well, we've got Matt from Collective Shift, so I'll hand over him to do a bit of an intro. Thank you, Ben. Yes, Matt Williamson is my name, Head of Research and Content at Collective Shift. I've been working full-time in the crypto space since 2017, so that is my, my whole professional career now. Uh, and also invested into crypto since 2017 and have continued doing so uh, over the years. So, you know, learned a lot of investment lessons myself and, you know, through educating, you know, thousands of people over the years with Ben, I've had a lot of conversations and, and sort of putting together these common lessons learned that I'm looking forward to sort of getting into in this session tonight. Also done a bit of, you know, presentations at industry conferences and whatnot. So yeah, looking forward to you know, getting into it and hopefully teaching you a thing or two uh, in the coming hour. Thank you, Matt. And also Tommy from SwiftX. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, guys, I'm Tommy, head of product strategy at SwiftX. You might have seen or, or heard from me, whether you liked it or not, on, on uh, Tapping Into Crypto podcast that we have. I've <laughs> uh, been in crypto since about 2013. I've uh, been working kind of full time SwiftX for about four and a half years. I was the first employee at the business, and yeah, I guess the the biggest the biggest um, biggest way I could I could introduce myself is I'm absolutely obsessed with with product and absolutely obsessed with the advancement of, of crypto in general. Whether that's through education, like we're doing tonight with um, um, Ben, Matt, and Collective Shift, um, or or whether it's through building innovative products in the industry and kind of tapping into the ease of use and all the things that the um, the pain points that currently exist in in the industry. Awesome, thank you, Tommy. Hey, Peter, welcome to the to, to the stream. Uh, and also, uh, you know, not just because we're talking out of our behind, we actually have um, you know some really quality members. One one that of, of most of you might uh, might remember, Chris Judd, um, two time Brownlow medalist, um, uses also Collective Shift on a day to day basis um, to help him navigate the asset class. Uh, Chris is actually running his own fund now. Tommy, not sure if you knew that, but um, <laughs> he's out. He's out. He's out. Of the AFL made in <laughs> not a crypto fund, but he's uh, exposed nonetheless. That's a good. It's a solid endorsement, Ben. I'll, I'll take that. He was. Uh, <laughs> he, he's a champion of the game. So you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll just say that he makes good decisions. He's, he's no Collingwood supporter, but um, but it was close enough. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, now I'm going to hand over to Matt to talk about um, some of the common mistakes we see a lot of investors make and why they are actually killing your portfolio. And then we're going to walk you through, you know, how to turn these upside down and, and get these back on as benefits instead of uh, mistakes. So hand over to you, Matty. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I think great time of the market during these sort of boring, you know, low volatility times to really you know, be stepping back and like I'm personally be planning, you know, quite comprehensively for what I'm going to be doing, you know, in as we get into what what is likely going to be the next sort of cycle uh, running higher and it's a great time to just assess you know how did you go if you have been in crypto uh in past years or even the last 12 months or so you know just just reflecting on on your own performance and you know whether you made any of these mistakes i know you know i personally did when i started you know investing in the crypto space and of course all a lot of members and just people in the public i speak to 
Uh, so we'll get through some of these. There's about seven altogether, but as you'll see at the end, there's, there's a common theme through all of these. So too many altcoins. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, you know, the thousands, no, 10,000 plus these days of altcoins that are out there and on the crypto market. Uh, you see a lot of people just, you know, buying into these and they're slowly adding to them. And all of a sudden, you know, they've got 40, 50. I've even spoken to some people with, you know, over a hundred altcoins in their portfolio. They couldn't really tell me what, you know, dozens of them even do. Uh, so it's sort of, again, something where you can easily lose track of the progress of each altcoin once you get over sort of a critical number, call it 5, 10, 15, sort of different for every person. FOMO buying, so fear of missing out. Buying sort of based on just emotion. You're seeing the charts maybe going up very dramatically or down very dramatically and you're sort of you know just you're instantly sort of you know impulsively sort of you know pressing the buy button uh not really connecting it to any strategy or any plan that you had again very very common crypto is such a well <laughs> not in the past few months but traditionally a very volatile uh market and therefore it can sort of you know lead a lot of people to make decisions that when they step back and really, you know, zoom out, they probably admit that they wouldn't have otherwise made it if they did have sort of a plan. Listening to bad advice, this one can, you know, uh, I think fair enough, it can be tricky to sort of determine what is and is not bad advice when you're sort of getting into the space or even just bad, a poor quality information, you could even put it as, where that you get a lot of people sort of leading you down one path into a certain source of information on youtube or or a podcast and you know maybe you lean too heavily into that one source of information and all of a sudden you know you're basing your decisions as a, from an investment standpoint on that information that's something that's extremely common and i think um i definitely encourage people to really have a sort of diverse information diet to sort of get that range of different opinions so can get into that more in the uh q a of course, later. Just a reminder, anyone who is watching this tonight, you can put in questions throughout the throughout this session and we will get to them towards the end. Trading too much. Now, this is, again, sort of a common theme, which we'll get to soon. People all of a sudden not really getting into the crypto market with the view of being an investor who goes about their day, you know, having their investments on the side and not really needing to actively check up on them. But then all of a sudden they're finding themselves you know, glued to the screen, you know, for hours and hours on end, checking the charts. And they're trying to basically do a crash course on how to trade cryptocurrencies. Uh, all, all the while, they're versing people who have been basically full-time traders for five, 10 years or so. Uh, and all of a sudden, they're just making mistake after mistake, chasing their losses. Uh, that's, that's something, again, that's very common. Chasing high yields. Again, there's a lot of projects out there that will be promoting or very you know sharing their double digit percentage yields uh people get lured into these because you know they think oh if i can i put a thousand dollars in two thousand dollars in you know if i just leave it there i can get a very high yield uh, a lot of the time you know people don't read the details for example you may have to put in the native token of that of that particular project and then you know yes you might get 10 or 20 percent extra of those tokens However, the price of that actual token itself may crash. People, again, it's just experience and not sort of doing your own sort of research first before making those decisions. Not exposed to the right sectors. Again, similar to some of these, they can be hard to distinguish when you're, when you're new to the space. But I think one, I guess, key message here that I'd like to share with you is that we may all be correct here tonight that crypto is going to be a significantly bigger, I guess, market in the future. But that does not necessarily mean all of us will be successful. Well, it yeah, definitely does not mean that we'll all be successful um, you know, from an investment standpoint. And that's just something, again, that's, that's very common uh, misconception where people think any exposure means it's going to be successful. Absolutely not the case. And that brings me to our last sort of point here, which is just do not have the right strategy or do not have a strategy, more importantly. Um, it's really just, it sounds extremely simple. And I think a lot of people sort of 
just skip this step because of how simple and cliche it is. But you really do just have to have a plan and a strategy, which we will get to a bit later in this session. Uh, because if you look at some of these you know, mistakes here, like too many altcoins, FOMO buying, trading too much, like they are all almost a direct consequence of deviating or from a strategy or even a consequence of not even having a strategy to begin with. So yeah, those seven, again, like, believe me when I say we've, we've, we have like talked to hundreds, Ben's probably talked to thousands of people over the years who these mistakes have kept coming, coming up time and time again. Um, and yeah, really looking to set the scene here tonight with, with those ones. So again, any questions, feel free to shoot them in with regards to any of these, but not sure if you had any more uh, points to add on to that one, Ben. Yeah, the, the too many altcoins is is one, uh, and, and not that altcoins are a bad thing. I think altcoins have an allocation in, in most people's portfolios. But mm. you know what I tend to see is people get FOMO from their friends or they hear something online and then they go chasing an altcoin and you end up with 30 or 40 altcoins in your portfolio. And what happens is the conviction or knowledge or even confidence around the assets you have is quite low. So then you've got 40 altcoins that you're not really even sure what most of them do, which means you can't keep an eye on them in a bull market. Some of them are going to perform really badly. Some are going to perform really well, but then you don't know what to sell, what to hold. Like it's just too much. So having a number of altcoins in your portfolio that you can stay on top of, that you understand, and then you can actually monitor through the bull market, I think is really important. Um, and, and being patient with those altcoins. You know, my, my first cycle, I, I had too many, didn't realize what most of them did. Um, and it wasn't until the second and third cycle that I really wound down the altcoins that I had and had more conviction. That way you can have, you know, larger conviction plays on the altcoins that you really like versus having just a number of things that you're just hoping and praying. Um, and then the other ones you mentioned, Matt, are spot on too. Tommy, I'm not sure if you had any other thoughts on that. Yeah, just, I guess, just to highlight, there's a good chance people don't know, but we've made probably all of these mistakes. And that's the reason why we know about them. And we're trying to call people out early at this stage of the market when it's almost like not too late, I guess. Now is the time to be trying to develop your strategy. Like, like Matt said, just being aware and conscious that you probably will do some form of buying. You will buy some all kinds at some point, but that doesn't mean it needs to get out of hand as you build into the new cycle. You will trade too much. Hopefully people have learned enough lessons from chasing high yields that that's one that we don't see as much of for the next cycle, but will we see, see some of it? Yeah, absolutely we will. Um, building a very basic strategy, and I know you guys are gonna touch, in, touch on that very soon, is the best option for probably 95% of people that are gonna be listening tonight or you know, listening later on. And really simplifying that, I think that's where you, know, you guys do a lot of work in that area and, and, and help people get started and, and know where to dip the toe. Yeah, yeah, spot on, Tommy. And yeah, we're going to get to that uh, in a second. So if you've if you made some of these mistakes or you just resonate with them, don't don't fear. We're going to help you sort of through that and navigate that through tonight. But the next little section I want to touch on is you know why time in the market is crucial in crypto, and I think a lot of people can resonate with this getting in at the wrong time. And usually your first investments are probably going to be in a bull market because that's when the market is really exciting. Unlike right now, the market is quite boring. So for the fact that those are people that are tuning in tonight, well done. Um, because usually the people that are in and investing and uh, you know educating themselves in a bear market are those that are the ones that get rewarded the most in the bull. So well done to everyone tonight. But really what I wanted to touch on is around the four-year cycle. And crypto tends to follow this based off the halving cycle that we have. So as you can see here, the last three, uh, four cycles, three out of the four years, we have a really um, intense green period where, we're, where the markets are really rallying. And then on one of those, um, every four years, the market declines a lot. And that is always after uh, the, the halving, you know, in, in the past. Now, what we had last year was a 65% decline. And then year to date, we're up about 84% on Bitcoin alone already. So what you can see here is what most people do is they buy at the top. They're buying 2013, they're buying 2017, they're buying 2021. And then the market crashes, they panic and they sell. And we see this time and time again, retail investors follow the same uh, train of train of thought. They buy off emotions and they sell off emotions because they're, they're, they're in fear. So timing is really crucial because if you time the market correctly, you can actually get in at the right time and make a considerable amount of more money. Now, Matt shared back in December of 2022, Bitcoin was at 16,000 US dollars. Matt shared with um, our, our members back, back then in, in December why we thought the market 
was was forming a bottom. And if you're looking at the right metrics and charts, there's not one metric or one chart that's going to give you the answers. But when you line up, you know, on-chain analysis, fundamental analysis, macro, you can start to form a bit of a narrative. And what's most important is you you sort of look through the noise because what you hear online and what you see from people on Twitter and see from people on YouTube is emotional. You tend to get quite emotional when listening to, um, you know, the crowd because the crowd tends to resonate and everyone starts to think the same way. Uh, and I was listening to a, an episode recently from Pomp and, and one of the, the best things that he, he sort of mentioned on this podcast is around like the best investors are never thinking about what everyone else are thinking about. They're always thinking about the the other side. What are the minority thinking of? What's the other voice? What are the other opinions that someone might have right now? And I think that's really important in a, in a place like now when no one's really thinking of crypto, the markets are flat, the markets are boring, everyone's bearish. Well, what what are the minority thinking about? What are we thinking tonight? And I think that's where the opportunity lies. I was just going to call that out, Ben, that now is almost the perfect time to join that minority or to be part of that minority. Because like you said, nobody is interested in, in crypto really right now, you know, only really specific and focused people on the industry. So it's almost like coming at the perfect time when we've seen this period of, as Matt call it, um, you know, zero, almost zero volatility over the last, call it, you know, a month or so. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on, mate. And, and I think it's important for us to step back and think about where the space is going. I think we get really have our short term hats on sometimes because we're quite emotional and everyone wants to make money very quickly. But the reality is it takes time. And one of one of my favorite, uh, you know, research pieces by ARK Invest, which is uh, a piece on where the uh, Bitcoin projections could get to is a really fascinating thing, not necessarily because of what they project the price could be, but just based on the use cases of, of Bitcoin and why so many people um, underestimate where, where the space is going. Rob Martin, yes, we are actually live, <laughs> um, unless I'm in the future. Uh, so, you know, one of the things here, you know, outside of digital gold, and I believe Bitcoin is a superior asset than physical gold, we look at physical gold at a you know nine or ten trillion dollar market cap, and Bitcoin at a half a trillion dollar market cap, right? So even if we're able to penetrate into some of the physical gold, um, you know, capital, we're going to start to get a real um, you know increase in the price. Then you've also got the institutional investments. So you've got you know companies like MicroStrategy or Tesla accumulating a lot of Bitcoin on their balance sheet because they know that the purchasing power of cash continues to decline. Or then you've got like the remittance asset or corporate treasuries. You've got um, also you know high net wealth. Um, Caesar resistant assets. So for like superannuation funds and uh, retirement funds getting access to Bitcoin. So with the BlackRock ETF, right? So as we get more ability for having, you know, having exposure to the asset, we're going to start to get a lot, um, you know, a lot more capital inflows. So the projections here, potential projections here that ARK Invest have, you know, by 2030 at a bearish case is $260,000 Bitcoin. And that's just not a number in the sky. They've backed that up with a you know, penetration rates off those price targets. And this was a longer a research piece, but, you know, and then a bullish case for at 1.48 million. Like this is some insane numbers. And I think just back to the asymmetric upside, like why we think, you know, Bitcoin and crypto is such a great investment is because of the asymmetric upside, meaning that the, what Bitcoin could do if it sets out to achieve anything that it's trying to is a huge upside potential versus the downside risk of it's being around for the last 12 or 13 years, it's retraced more than 80%, like three or four times. You know, Bitcoin's died, you know, countless times. Everyone's given up countless times. And yet here it is still day after day doing its thing. Um, and I think that's what's the most exciting part of allocating crypto to your portfolio. You're spot, you're spot on, Ben. I mean, I was, I'm just reading, it, reading some of these numbers and... You know, even if the bear case was half wrong, I think a lot of people investing now would be pretty happy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you look at it in, in those terms, but I mean, to put to put real data behind it, and I guess we've seen some of these use cases already start to come to light. So it doesn't seem as far fetched as it might have, you know, sounded back in 2015, 40 and 15 after we've seen massive corrections in the market. So, yeah. you know, it's there is a there is a I won't say a clear path, but there is a data-driven path to how we we do get to um, you know certain numbers like this, which you know would outperform any investment on the planet if that does. Like I said, even if it's fifty percent wrong. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where where it goes. 
Yeah, spot on, man. And and the other thing we like to look at is is the fundament. Uh, so the on chain analysis. So you know, one of the beautiful things about um, most cryptocurrencies is that they are built on a blockchain, and a blockchain is an immutable ledger that anyone can look at at any period of time. And one of our uh, one of our on chain analysts uh, internally collective shift. His name's Checkmate. He actually works for Glassnode. Um, I believe he's probably one of the best on-chain analysts in the world. One of the uh, one of the charts he tends to look at, and that we've been looking at for a little while, is the market value to realize value ratio. And anyone that's you know follows our work, they've probably seen this chart before. But it really just gives us a ratio indication of where Bitcoin becomes undervalued based off what you can buy Bitcoin at at any point in time, which is the black line, and then the orange line is the average value of Bitcoin that's already held by people that have that have um, bought it. And every time we've been below that red line, that $1 ratio, we get an increase of price. So the same back in 2012, 2015, 2019, and then most recently in late 2022, every time that line goes below the dollar ratio, we get an increase in price. And that was around the time that we we posted that we were, you know, we were buying again and then Bitcoin rallied like 85% in, in a number of months. Now, again, not one chart gives us the, the blueprint. You know, if anyone's giving you the, the one chart or the one indicator, you know, that's, it's, it's most likely not going to be right because it's, it's not as easy as that. But what we can start to do is piece together a narrative and piece together some story and some actual charts and numbers to give us an indication. And this is why timing the market is crucial because if you're following and getting in when people are getting out, being bearish, sorry, being bullish when people are bearish and vice versa, that's when you can start to make uh, your portfolio um, into a position where you can actually make those gains. And like we said before, like actually starting to think of the contrarian view, not following the crowd. Markets, or any market, stock market, crypto market, any markets, there's winners and losers, right? At the end of the day, you are trading against someone on the other end of the screen, whether you're trading or investing, there's winners and losers. That's how markets work. And in pretty much every market, only the minority win. Um, there's very, very few cases where, you know, the majority of markets win. And that's why you need to think contrarian and not follow the crowd. Now, the next little piece here that I wanted to touch on was around, you know, why we believe now the time, now the time is to invest. And this was, you know, I, I would have liked to add another screenshot here, but we didn't have time off the back of PayPal announcing in the last week that they're launching their own cryptocurrency stablecoin, which is absolutely huge news. And it did absolutely nothing to the price. <laughs> um, it didn't move it to Bo Peep. And, uh, you know, that is a good indication of where we're at in the market right now. People are bored. People are over crypto. Traders are bored. No one's looking at it. The, the price isn't moving. And, and that's the opportunity. That's, that's for me, is a great indicator of where we're at and why right now the market is undervalued. If that was to happen in a bull market, PayPal announcing their own crypto stablecoin, like that would have been a big move, probably a 10 to 40% move. I'm not sure what you reckon, Tommy and Matt, but it would have been a big move in my opinion. Um, but yet now it's, it's barely moved the market, right? So you add that, then you've got some of the biggest banks in the US launch, literally launching their own crypto exchange. So Fidelity, Schwab, and Citadel have launched their own crypto exchange, EDX. This is huge, right? In Australia, you've got banks shutting down people and banning people from their crypto accounts. But in the US, you've got some of the biggest banks in the world launching their crypto exchange. That for me is where this space is going, right? So you can either be left behind or you can actually join and know that you know this space isn't going anywhere. And that's where BlackRock have also come in. Like, yes, there's a big opportunity for them to make money and getting an ETF, but they also know that People want to buy Bitcoin. People want to buy crypto. It's not going anywhere. It hasn't gone anywhere and won't go anywhere. And that's where these bigger institutions um, uh, are getting involved to allow more and more people to get at, you know, exposure to the asset class. Tommy, Matt, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that. No, really just the, yeah, when good news is coming in and not impacting prices, I, I, I personally... You know, almost selfishly get excited because it's it's a sign that we're in that sort of apathetic market conditions and it's it's a sign i think where it's almost a last stage of that bear market uh, in my experience where all the sort of forced selling is done uh there's not really much new net new sort of retail money coming in so the only sort of people buying are just sort of existing investors in the space um and you saw that even recently with like also sort of negative news uh such as even the, the coinbase and um uh yeah some other lawsuits in this in the industry in the us in particular like they it was quite negative news but did not really move down the price so i think this sort of 
you know, in price insensitivity really um, is something that I'm particularly paying attention to because as you've got on the screen there, plus the PayPal news as well, all fundamentally, you know, really, you know, again, like upping the quality of, I guess, the crypto infrastructure and what the industry, I suppose, has at its disposal to sort of let in the next sort of wave of, of users and capital. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time from, from that aspect. Yeah, I think if you, just, if you just look at the exposure numbers, if you look at these big brands and you think about the actual addressable market in terms of exposure that these brands can, can bring, essentially put crypto in front of, through their own means, you know, they're not doing it out of the good of their health. They're doing it because they want to make money, then, you know, as you rightly called out, but they're also doing it because they believe they're building into opportunity in the future. So, and it is the perfect time for these, for these businesses to do it. You know, it's relatively low risk for them right now. You know, they know that the big, I guess it's assumed the big push and the big market drive is coming in the next, you know, year, 18 months, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, I guess no one has a crystal ball at the end of the day, but they're, you know, they're, you want to go to where the, you want to skate to where the puck is going, right? And and it, and it definitely seems to be going towards these big brands. The, the ETF news, I think I mentioned before we started, I thought personally that it had a bit more of an impact than it should have. And then some of the other news like PayPal probably should have had more and it didn't have as much. So We've, uh, we've shaken a lot out and we're in this kind of period now of accumulation and it's, it's, um, it's the perfect time to be just getting these strategies down, Pat. Yeah, spot on, Tommy. Uh, and Ray, yes, it cracks, me, it cracks me up. People were happy to buy Bitcoin 90 plus K, but now they're scared. That's, that's, uh, that's psychology, man. That is human emotion. And that's why tonight we're going to share with you how to actually create your own strategy to take the emotion out. Um, because that's just that's just how this is how most humans work. We get excited um, and we we follow emotion. Uh, hey Samantha uh, from Dear Crypto, thanks for tuning in. Mopar uh, from YouTube, Crypto Down Under, goodness, keep smashing it, SwiftX team. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, fantastic little night here of crypto. Now I'm going to head over to Matt to touch on uh, where to really get the right information from if you're not if you don't have that confidence or don't have that knowledge and you know, you're trying to navigate your crypto portfolio and want to improve it, we're going to head over to Matt, who is then going to talk about uh, actually creating a strategy. So get uh, get a little notepad and pen out or actually no one uses that anymore, do they? Sure. And, uh, <laughs> Matt's going to just walk you through yeah. that. Some sort Some of sort thing. Of to, we type on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think, oh, as many of you would know watching this, uh, particularly those on YouTube, you would know that's probably the most common sort of entry point into sort of consuming crypto content, learning about it is YouTube. Those thumbnails would be quite familiar to to many of you uh, with the sort of, I guess, incentive to create sort of shocking or, you know, entertainment-based content that triggers your emotions and, and sort of sucks you into some of watching 10, 10 minutes of, of content that could really just be summed up in like a minute. Um, again, as Ben touched on earlier, there's that sort of, a lot of educational content out there, but then there's probably more of that sort of entertainment driven content. So again, it can lead you down to a path where you're not really fundamentally sort of learning that much about what cryptocurrency is, what blockchain technology, you know, the applications of it, the use cases of it. Uh, and that's something that we really, you know, try to focus on at Collective Shift, stripping it back to those fundamentals to give you the good platform to, you know, improve in whatever you want to do. Uh, from you know an investment standpoint, financial advisors as well, like they are, they I think in in time they will be you know a really sound source uh, to go to for yeah for learning more about crypto. But the reality is today you know, the the market is just so minuscule. Like I I saw today even you know the the size of the crypto market today is like one point two trillion US dollars, which isn't actually that much in today's sort of <laughs> today's sort of figures like it's still less than the amounts of the market value of uh, you know the bigger companies like apple and and amazon and whatnot so again in time they don't i can you can sort of forgive them for not knowing much about crypto at the moment so it sort of leaves us with this question of where do you go and i think there is to a lot of people's surprise there are sort of crypto native um sort of traditional or web two as some people would describe it traditional sort of subscription businesses which are really i suppose you know specialize in creating sort of like synthesized sort of condensed 
educational content for sort of you know time poor uh, people out there who are working full time in in other areas that aren't to do with crypto. So yeah, that is improving over the years, and it is something that's you know been maturing and and looking forward to continuing to contribute to that. Uh, in terms of the strategies, this is sort of going to be a, a big part of tonight's session. And of course, keep those questions coming in. Uh, thank you for everyone that is doing so. We will get to them soon. Uh, so again, we've gone through the mistakes at the start. Okay, like let's let's talk about ways to sort of mitigate against sort of repeating those mistakes in in many of our cases, or even avoiding them if you are a first time sort of crypto investor. All of these will seem, as I said earlier, pretty, pretty simple, pretty cliche, but it's for a reason. You know, these cliches exist for a reason because a lot of the time they're just simply true. And if you sort of try to ignore them, you'll often learn, you'll basically round trip and, and ultimately come to arrival, arrive at the conclusion that how you should have just follow the cliches in many of these. So we'll get through some of them now. So goals, again, very simple crypto investors if you ask them what their goal was many of them would say to make to make money but you know you really need to get more specific than that in my experience because if you'll again be have a tendency to sort of get wrapped up in the emotion of it all when the markets do get a lot more volatile than they are today uh goals you know i'm not here today to tell you about what your goals should be it really just depends on your own individual circumstances some people it might be, you know, a, a target to, you know, you know, buy buy a house or something. For others, it might be something completely different. But at least just thinking more about that and, and contemplating that while the markets are quiet is something that I personally believe is something that can be extremely valuable to do. Goals often tie into risk or sort of appetite for risk. So as many of you would know, cryptocurrencies are again a very tiny asset class all things considered, which then implicitly means that they are very risky as well. Uh, so some people, you know, if they are going to invest in cryptocurrencies, they might just be happy, you know, putting some money into Bitcoin and ETH sort of, you know, to combine they're about 60 to 70% of the total market cap of, you know, all of those cryptocurrencies out there. For other people, they'll be happy going into, you know, the altcoins that we you know, spoke about a bit earlier and I'll be covering some of those sectors uh, in a few minutes. Again, it really just depends on your individual risk tolerance. And, you know, if your goals are a bit more sort of ambitious, um, that would sort of like in many cases imply that you would need to take on some additional risk. But again, just thinking about these things deeply and sitting down with yourself, you know, maybe actually with a notepad and a pen, then it'll probably get you away from a screen and you can actually put some time into thinking about these things can be very valuable. Timeline. Uh, again, base, what is your timeline when you're talking about your time in the crypto market? This again, isn't really, there's no generic answer, but knowing how long you want to be a part of this asset class in terms of the capital that you have, uh, can really help you, I suppose, execute on your plans when the bull market does eventually come. Assets, as I spoke about earlier, there is a, there's well more than 10,000 cryptocurrencies out there today. Uh, the vast majority of them, I'm confident at least, will just fizzle out into nothingness over the sort of years to come. Uh, however, I firmly believe that crypto as a whole market will grow significantly. So again, selecting those particular assets is something that I actually do quite a lot of work on at Collective Shift in terms of assessing individual projects and sort of you know, presenting you know, why this may work, why this is even needed, does it even need to exist, etc. Asking those questions can be you know, very valuable. Sell strategy, out of these seven sort of dot points here, I would actually say sell strategy is the one that gets the least sort of um, I don't know. It's it's the it's the one that is least discussed. You'll you'll see people talk about buy strategies, you know, how to dollar cost average into the market. But you know, when the bull market comes, those people will really not talk much at all about knowing when to sell. Um, it's just something I've noticed, you know, time and time again. So just as you've got to put some planning into how you're going to enter. Uh, a specific asset, I would also encourage you to think about and to ideally 
run through some scenarios in your head about what would actually make you sell out of a given cryptocurrency. You know, if it goes up 200, 300, 400%, are you going to take out 10%, 20%, 30%, for example? Again, there's no, there's no sort of panacea, like answer that, that, that solves everyone's solution. It's up to you. Uh, and it differs between individual cryptocurrencies. Uh, but again, thinking about that can save you a lot of pain in terms of not repeating those mistakes that we spoke about earlier. Automation really just comes down to, I suppose, I like to think of it as the more you think about and put time into your strategy, the more likely you are to simply, I guess, remove the, I guess, emotion out of your decision making and you can you can basically just automatically execute on your strategy when the time comes in the in the bull market. Psychology again is is very sort of interwoven through all of these sort of dot points, which again just comes out to knowing what your own sort of psychological tendencies are. Are you someone who makes more sort of impulsive decisions? If so, this strategy is probably even more important. Um, and even again, just acknowledging when there are cryptocurrencies going up by 50 to 100% in a given day, which happens quite often in the bull market, um, you've just got to be prepared for just how, yeah, how I suppose stressful and I suppose how much emotion can be tied up into the market when everyone is getting euphoric. So those seven there, I would, yeah, again, really encourage you to just sit down with yourself and just, just think about all of these things. And yeah, we do create quite a bit of content on this sort of stuff as well to help people, you know, just think through these things. Thanks, Matt. I, I recently updated my uh, strategy. So the first cycle I went through, I didn't have this strategy, completely lost out, went up and down, you know, we've all been there. The second strategy, or the second cycle, I actually created the strategy and that really helped me make the most of my capital or um, profits in crypto. Um, I was able to get pretty early into the metaverse, um, some of the metaverse projects before the metaverse really blew up. And having that strategy, I had exactly what my sell strategy was. I knew my timeline. I knew my risk appetite, knew the assets I wanted to get into. And then having that automated sell strategy was really important. You know, getting into investments or asset classes, no, sorry, getting into investments that are sub $10 million market caps that run up to three, three, four, five hundred million dollar $500 million market caps, you know, is, is very, it makes you very uh, emotional. It makes you very euphoric and it be, can be very hard to sell. For those that have been through a cycle before and have made paper profits, you know how hard it is to sell. So writing that strategy out, knowing exactly what you're trying to achieve can take all the emotion out of it. And we see time and time again that people that don't have that written down and are emotional, you know, you just you just aren't able to execute. You know, you just think and hope it's going to keep going higher. Um, so really, re really, really recommend um, just spending 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes writing this down, putting it aside. Mine's in my Notion document. I've got it written down. I can come back to it when when the prices are moving again. Do you have something like this, Tommy? Yeah, I mean, just to wrap like goals and risks together, just to run through these points very quickly. I'd love, I'd love for us to get to a place where the narrative for people isn't, I'm happy to take a risk. I'm only going to put $100 on this thing, but I have no idea what it is. And I'm happy to just use that as a as a kind of a broad stroke strategy during a bull market which look yes it can pay off one out of ten time or one out of a hundred time but that's that is something that we see time and time again you know you if you have your plan or your strategy in place that hundred dollars or thousand dollars or whatever it is could be put it put towards the investments that you've actually vetted you've actually done the research on you know they have a use case and look i've i've been the worst the worst uh <laughs> The worst defender here with this you know during a bull market yes we all get caught up we've we've talked about the mistakes the time in terms of the timeline as well i mean when it comes to those types of assets your timeline is 10x shorter than you think it is you know you might have done 100 percent in an asset you know everyone's looking at the next 100 next 200 <laughs> of the asset and you know next thing you're minus 50 and, and that's game over and, and you're kind of looking to move on to the next one. And that's the same type of mistakes that people make every time. Um, in terms of the sales strategy and automation, just want to touch on that one briefly. I mean, we, you know, we do have tools at SwiftX, like we've, we've built out a, um, a prompting, 
a prompting um, feature recently that, that helps you to visualize kind of what that sell strategy can mean in terms of a dollar, dollar value or a percentage value. We have, you know, uh, lim- market orders and limit orders where you can actually, you know, pre- preset these, these positions. Again, mm-hmm. we'll probably touch on where you hold your crypto, but at least that can help you to, to get started and at least to start to think about and be able to visualize what does taking 100% or 200% out actually mean for my investment? So, you know, I think it's it's all these things coupled together is really just a good formula for for getting the right kind of habits in place. Yeah, I love the products you're rolling out as well, Tommy. That's fantastic. Um, hey, Bamboo, welcome to the live stream. Love your work. Samantha, I reckon dollar cost averaging, sticking to a portfolio percentage strategy and trying not to check the market regularly is the way to go. All about automation. 1,000% agree. Right, Matt, what everyone's been waiting for, mate, this is the uh, is what everyone loves. So what we've done is uh, we've we've sort of combined a lot of the research that we've been doing over, over on our, uh, for our members and put together some sectors that we and our analysts uh, and Matt heads up those analysts think that have uh, high growth potential and Matt's going to walk through those three sectors now and give you a little bit of reasoning behind that. So hand it back over to you, Matty. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ben. And we'll get into questions uh, after this as well. So, you know, these times, these quiet periods, again, going back to 2018, 19, when I was just getting started in the crypto research space, uh, it was a great time to sort of have quite a high conviction, at least I found it relatively easy to identify uh, what was going to be relevant by the time the next bull market came you know relatively easy compared to when things are just crazy and there's just noise everywhere and it's extremely hard to know what is legitimate what is authentic so in in that sort of similar vein from 2018 and 19 it's very similar to i would say last year and even 2023 now so we're getting to the end of the bear the end of the bear market and I've got three sort of altcoin sectors that myself and the research team at Collective Shift have sort of high conviction on that they're going to be, you know, quite a very, very relevant part of the next cycle higher. So first one here, liquid staking. So some blockchains such as Ethereum sort of operate in part. Their security is sort of based off the system that many of you would know called proof of stake, where you just have to deposit that native token of that blockchain and it goes towards simply sort of to simplify just keeping the blockchain running in the way it was designed to. Uh, there's now something called liquid staking where protocols will give you basically like a receipt token of the, of that staked asset. So staked ETH in this example. Um, why do people want these things? Well, with these receipt tokens, you can then use them in the world of DeFi or decentralized finance. Many people are using these what are called liquid staking tokens and, and uh, you know, earning earning interest or earning yield on them by deploying them in different sort of DeFi apps. And as you can see on the chart there, it's grown tremendously over the past sort of one to two years, particularly the last sort of six months with a major upgrade that happened on Ethereum earlier this year. And yeah, very, very confident, uh, at least in my opinion, that this will be another sort of significant uh, growth area with those sort of liquid staking protocols. So Rocket Pool actually has a, quite a big presence in Queensland, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. I think the founding team and then Lido, they are the two sort of leaders in this liquid staking space. So they are two to check out if you're not familiar with them. Second one here is Ethereum scaling solutions. I'm sure many of you, if you are watching this and you're keeping up with crypto, you would of course uh, heard about this. But reality is today that Ethereum in and of itself just cannot scale. So when thousands of people are wanting to use it all at once, you run into this issue where it gets congested and the fees just skyrocket, where it's costing us 100 to 300 sort of US dollars equivalent in ETH just to pay a transaction fee. Obviously, that is definitely not sustainable and that will not scale at all. So we've got these things called layer two solutions, which is one of the main ways that ethereum is trying to scale where people can you know transact with one another on these layer two networks such as sort of optimism and and arbitrum and then those networks will periodically sort of communicate back to the ethereum blockchain and again sort of take that pressure off of the ethereum blockchain itself 
uh, where the fees can then be lower. So that's starting to work over the past sort of two years. And again, particularly year to date, it's it's had some really good progress. And there's another big upgrade coming to Ethereum uh, pr- probably at the very end of this year that will help uh, sort of sort of accelerate that movement towards layer twos by sort of cutting down the fees even more. So that's a particular area that the, the team here at Collective Shifts have uh, been doing a lot of content on because again, it sort of needs to work to really be be frank. Uh, it sort of has to work for, I guess, Ethereum to sort of be successful in the in the sort of short to medium term. There are some other areas they're working on, but they're more longer term things. So definitely another area to, to look up. The third sort of altcoin area here or sector is gaming. So many of you, of course, may have heard of this, but there are many games that can, uh, that are being developed that can sort of either be entirely based on the blockchain or in most cases, they are sort of partially, I guess, communicating or, or being built on blockchain technology. Uh, so the benefits, why, why are they even deciding to do this? Most of the benefits relate to user ownership. So maybe owning an in-game asset um, you know, or, or a piece of like a cosmetic sort of item. Uh, and then also there may be some interoperability uh, sort of benefits that are, that are coming. Uh, gaming, why is it one of the top three? Uh, mainly because it was the number one sort of most well-backed, um, I guess, sector. When you're talking about all of the crypto sectors, probably about a dozen of them or so, in 2022, it received the most sort of venture capital. Importantly, this in and of itself does not guarantee that it's going to be a raging success. However, when you do have something that's attracting the most venture capital out of all the crypto sectors, to me, that's a pretty obvious signal that you should at least sort of focus in or or at least it warrants you sort of checking in on it and and monitoring the, the progress of this sort of particular sector. So we do have some analysts on the Collective Shift team that cover gaming a bit more closely than myself. I'm not much of a gamer uh, myself, but definitely sort of interested in sort of seeing what what it can do and following the progress because I know there's quite a few uh, highly anticipated games that are getting close to, to launching. So to sum it up, there would be liquid staking, Ethereum scaling solutions, and gaming. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions coming in, so we'll get to those very, very shortly. I also just wanted to touch on... Um, a case study here of, of one of the posts that Matt actually made back in February in an absolute boring sideways market that there is still opportunities to to get into some of these uh, old coins. So Pendle was a DeFi project that Matt liked, post about it, and it was up about 580% since he posted about it. Um, got listed on Binance. Uh, I think still 95% of old coins uh, are, are, you know, um, a crap. <laughs> I was going to try to use a technical word. They're just bad. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, if you can find, you know, the right sectors and you can get in at the right times, um, there's definitely still a strategy to be had around, you know, having an altcoin allocation then rotating back into Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever that looks like for you based on um, your strategy. Now, uh, the next little bit I wanted to just, first of all, recap uh, what we've spoken about so far. So we've spoken about the common mistakes that are killing your portfolio and how to navigate around those, why timing the market is super critical and why getting in at the wrong time can actually really hurt your portfolio, especially if you don't have that conviction. So the three altcoin sectors that Matt spoke about that we think have high growth potential, the personalized strategy, so actually going and creating that personalized strategy, plus then the future outlook um, and emerging trends and why the, the four-year cycle is um, important. Uh, and now we're going to get to Q&A, but before that, as I mentioned at the start, uh, we just wanted to quickly show you, uh, those that are on the call tonight, a little bit more about what we do here at Collective Shift. So, you know, for those that don't know, SwiftX are hosting tonight and we're a, a research partner of SwiftX. Um, and we do a lot of work with the SwiftX um, clients. And really, you know, w- what we do at the end of the day uh, is, uh, it's going to be easy if I show you, um, we're, a, we're a research platform. So we help <coughs> investors with their portfolio through research and analysis. So we're not an exchange, we don't buy or sell crypto. Uh, We're purely here to help you with your portfolio and give you some more confidence and insights and strategies um, to to look at the market. Now, is that showing, can you guys see my screen? Is that working? Um, Uh, It's got- Can you see my screen? No. No, it's got the slides. Okay, well, that's probably not gonna work then, is it? 
Um, let's see if that's... Nope. How's that? No? That's our, our faces. <laughs> Okay, now I've lost the uh, now I've lost the presentation. Okay, let me bring the presentation. <laughs> um, so, but okay, well I'm not going to be able to share my screen. So basically, at the end of the day, what we do uh, over Collective Shift, we have about a thousand clients we work with, and we really um, are going through you know altcoin analysis where we have um, what's called the shift list, where we share with you um, you know different altcoins, where we give you like a bullish rating, a, a bearish rating, neutral, and give you the research and insights behind it. So in a really simple and actionable format. Um, and now my slides won't work either. It's all uh, it's all gone. Um, it's all, all gone pear shaped here, team. <laughs> um, uh, but basically, yeah, for those that um, are wanting a little bit more reporting and a bit more re research and insights, whether it be fundamental analysis, where we have you know different altcoin sectors, um, you know more premium reports, we then personalize that in your own dashboard. So what you get is you can jump on a call with one of our team, um, and we walk through with you. Um, you know, and help you create that strategy. So for those things we mentioned tonight, if you're really struggling to put together that strategy or you have some questions around your own portfolio um, and you want to sit down with either, you know, one of our team, we can sit down with you and on a call, we can go through those things and help you get set up in our dashboard, um, go through those assets and really, you know, get yourself up for success. We do monthly calls as well with our analysts. So every every month we do calls like these, we can ask our, our analysts questions. We've got some resources. We've got a beginner's course. Really, there's a lot of things there to help you with your um portfolio um now i can't get my slides up so if you're interested in that what you can do is you can head over to collectiveshift.io uh, forward slash strategy and we offer these little 15 minute complimentary calls um and you can jump on a no obligation call with one of our team and we can help you um you know point you in the right direction so you can have a collective shift there's a little button in the top right hand corner and that will get you underway now we've lost all uh, slides here gents so we might just rotate into um into into q a um I'm just going to bring up our questions that have rolled in here. Do you want me to read these out, Tommy? Yeah, yeah. I, I reckon I reckon read them out, Matt. Just um... we'll just roll through these. Um, cool. First question from Cam on Facebook: What will be the right strategy to deal with the delisted assets slash coins? Just looking, just trying to get context on that one. I'm not sure exactly what what he that, means by that. That um, might be from an investing standpoint, perhaps. Mm. Um, uh, Matt, this might be more for you, but I think the you know the reality is delisted and assets slash coins, unless it's something like XRP, which had a big uh, potential to come back onto exchanges. Like if it's dead, if the like if the if the project is dead, well then from a from a from a portfolio perspective, it's probably worth just mentally you know considering it's gone and then writing off as a, as a tax loss and, and moving on. Um, if it's potential to come back because of like, it's a, you know, security or something, we'll maybe just hold on to it. Um, but if the project's dead, it's um, yeah, it's probably probably right thing just to take it as a loss and, and move on. Yeah. That if it, yeah, there's just liquidity, like, you know, how much liquidity is there? Uh, is it on listed on various other exchanges or even, like Uniswap or something like that. If, if it's just, if you can't find it, uh, many other places. So I will go coin gecko. They always have a good, um, you know, listing of places where those assets are, are listed, um, different exchanges and whatnot. Uh, so again, yeah, it really depends on, on individual sort of cryptocurrency basis on, on sort of your, what you should, what you should do from there. I see a question come through at the bottom um, for myself. Do SwiftDex have any action in place to navigate Australian banks now putting 24 hour <laughs> delays, holes on people trying to transfer AD, AD to their SwiftDex accounts? Um, absolutely love this topic and more than happy to cover it. <laughs> but um, yeah, look, it's, it's obviously something that we're navigating at the moment as, a, as an industry, I would say, and like not specific to an individual investor or even SwiftX specifically, it is it is a tricky one. I mean, the banks seem to be kind of largely aligning on what they think is is right. I think, you know, I think there was another question that came through earlier around, you know, are SwiftX kind of contributing to these conversations? And I guess the best thing we can tell people is that, yes, we as, you know, one of the leading exchanges in Australia are heavily um, committed and, and uh, con contributing heavily. To those conversations it's it's absolutely something we don't want to do we don't want people to be limited 
there are people, I guess, in the mindset that they need to be shopping around for the best bank or the bank that does support crypto. I mean, I don't think there is something that actually exists like that in, in market at the moment, but I guess there are some banks that are more heavily, um, yeah, I guess not, not as restrictive is probably the, you know, as, as good as I could say it right now. We, we have kind of built out features like Stripe deposits that a lot of people are using that don't seem to be incurring any restrictions at the moment. Again, there are some additional fees that people should look into when they're you know, using those types of um, depositing methods. It's, it's, um, it's a moving target and a bit of a live beast. So, you know, we will obviously share insights when, when that kind of comes across, but we are kind of the, the, the takeaway being we are kind of heavily um, engaged, working with kind of the regulators we can and and contributing to the banks when it comes down to you know the, the areas of concern for them. Um, it's it's important that we that we all pull together to get the right outcomes for um, for consumers at the end of the day. Yep, spot on, Tommy. Uh, Antonio, do you think the mass adoption catalyst will be the BlackRock ETF release? Uh, Matt wrote a good article the other day about this. So the two main adoption catalysts we believe is one, the halving next year. And number two is definitely the BlackRock ETF. I think that can be a big, um, a big, a big driver and big narrative. There's also some, some other ones that, uh, maybe people aren't considering, um, uh, Matt, which you might want to just quickly share. Yeah, I think, um, even, even the macro conditions, I think with liquidity, uh, conditions, I think projected to sort of improve, um, you know, into next year as well. I think that is going to align as well with all these uh, sort of internal crypto sort of catalysts. Uh, and then also, yeah, specific things to do with, uh, you know, new companies coming out, such as Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, uh, and now the CEO of, of his other company, Square. Um, I think he's also, they are releasing new Bitcoin um, you know, hardware uh, Bitcoin mining hardware and, and other sort of Bitcoin payment solutions. Uh, you know, the success of that, you know, you know, may sort of help, you know, drive more adoption of Bitcoin. And then also even things like Tesla, uh, you know, they famously sort of, you know, accepted Bitcoin. Uh, and then about a month later announced that they were no longer accepting Bitcoin due to environmental concerns. That was about two years ago or so. Uh, my suspicion is that they will eventually re- accept uh payments in bitcoin due to sort of bitcoin's environmental impact uh sort of benefit it has gotten better in the last sort of two years and i think the understanding of i suppose bitcoin's source where bitcoin mining is sourcing like overall is sourcing its its energy from i think that has again improved and that is something that tesla said would have to improve for it to start earning uh to start accepting bitcoin payments again so there's a lot of sort of you know things that that could be coming out more or less around the same time, uh, and that would definitely sort of catalyze um, a bull run, in my opinion. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm on mute there. There's two questions. Two, two right. questions here that we can sort of uh, link together. Uh, is it a good time? Is it a good idea to invest into the crypto index on the stock exchange because the governments could eventually govern it all? And could it be possible that government could try to crack down on cryptos by ordering the banks not to transact with crypto companies? Uh, so a few questions around banks. So first of all, it's important to note that governments can't control Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is completely decentralized and that's the idea of it, that it cannot be shut down. Now, uh, can governments have a crackdown on banks? Yes. And, you know, not that I, it's government driven, these it's happening in Australia, but banks definitely don't like crypto. So they're, they're having sort of these crackdowns. Um, but in terms of banks and like CBDCs and everything like that, like I only think it's a positive for Bitcoin. It's only going to drive more people to be aware of what's actually going on, um, you know, with these more centralized currencies uh, and, you know, governments trying to get more control through those, um, through those, through those, you know, new assets, you know, new digital currencies. I don't think governments could, you know, ban it all. I mean, they tried to ban gold back in the day, right? Like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't alive back then, I don't think. But, you know, you know, the governments tried to come out and make a rule that if you own physical gold, you had to go and hand it in. And the reality is just people just don't do it. Well, that's, you know, Bitcoin at the end of the day just can't be shut down and it can't be stopped. Uh, 
I don't know about a crypto index on the stock exchange. I don't think there is a crypto index on the stock exchange. I mean, there might be for companies that have exposure, but that wouldn't be spot crypto. Um, Tommy, Matt, I'm not sure if you have any other thoughts around the government cracking down on. Yeah, it's it's mainly yeah at the at the at the off ramps and on ramps, which like they're uh, to their cre- uh, like to to be fair, they are sort of have a lot of reason to know about you know how money is getting into and out of uh, exchanges. So I think that's sort of developed that framework and you know licensing domestic licensing in different countries. Uh, but yeah, as you said, the code base itself or the Bitcoin. Yeah, protocol there yeah, they, they can't directly sort of shut down um and i share a similar view that cbdc's will sort of help help i think almost put the spotlight a bit on bitcoin and help people appreciate it's sort of the non-sovereign nature of it and and why that is important in sort of a society such as like the one we're living in today uh, particularly as we're starting to slowly go towards a cashless uh, society and a purely digital one so yeah i don't really i'm not really too uh don't really view that as much of a threat um as 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 many other people sort of do i think yeah i think just on the crypto index piece we will absolutely in future have a crypto index trading on the asx the nasdaq wherever else right the i guess the main main point to note there is and i i assume a lot of people listening tonight and, and contributing at the moment in this type of market are kind of would consider themselves more crypto savvy or crypto native people or they're getting maybe they're getting started, but they crypto index on the ASX is probably not what they're looking for. And I think it's it definitely appeals to a certain type of client, certain type of investor. And yes, it does open the floodgates in terms of value entering the market. So I guess overall I don't see it as, as a massive negative, but whether that's for the type of investor that we're speaking to right now, I think it's it's probably the probably the main question. And yeah, again, it's it's not there yet. It doesn't exist in markets. So I guess on, until that does happen, we can um, we can reassess. Yeah, spot on, boys. Now some questions here, Alan. Any current hot tips? Pendle was a great one. Uh, uh, Brendan Pendle was a great recommendation. Any other hidden gems like that? Uh, yes, lots more where that came from, gents. But. Uh, Unfortunately, not here tonight. So if you're interested in that, head over to Collective Shift, um, book, in a, book in a call and we can show you what we do on the platform. I can't share my screen for some reason tonight. So I can't show you what we do, but basically we do altcoin analysis, ratings, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to help you find uh, where we think the market's moving. So head over to Collective Shift. Ben, do you, want us, do you want us to uh, scan back from our side back to that slide that you're looking for? I think we've, uh, we've given you um, control there now if you want to go back, try and go back to it. Let me see if I can. No, for some reason, it's just not liking me sharing my screen. Um... No, that's right. All good. No stress. Uh, for those who are interested, just head over to our website team and we can we can make that happen. Um... Right, I hope some more questions. Uh... This one is from Swiftex Tommy. Uh, thanks, Swiftex team, for all that you're doing. I've been trading with you since 2020 and haven't looked back. Is SwiftX working with you? Oh, you've already answered that. Sorry. That's, uh, that one's tick box. Question for Tommy. Uh, do, uh, do SwiftX have any action in place to navigate Australian banks now putting 24-hour delays holds on people trying to transfer AUD to their SwiftX accounts? I think we just, I briefly touched on that one as well. At the moment, it's it's kind of a, a watch, watch and see um, strategy in place. Again, I think there's a few people in comments have came across said that, you know, I'm still with Suncorp Bank and the, in- the deposits are going in instantly. People are having different experiences with it at the mm. moment, which is quite interesting. And, you know, I don't know if that comes down to the amount of times you've deposited to a crypto exchange or, you know, whether people have, you know, called up the bank to complain. I know, Ben, you, you guys have had your own kind of um, issues on that side. And it's, yeah, I think it's, there definitely seems to be kind of... Um, contrasting narratives when it comes to how people are actually um com- how this is coming into effect for people but yeah largely largely it is you know there's no real bank in australia that we would say right now supports crypto 100 percent. right it's 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 really just some restrictions are are more severe than others i mean it's definitely going to affect liquidity coming into the market it's something that we we're keeping an eye on and you know we're, we're absolutely contributing to all those conversations in a in a positive way to try and get the right types of resolutions that 
please both the customer, you know, ourselves as a business and also, you know, keep the banks happy in terms of like the fraud rates and the things that they're really concerned about. So it's a, you know, it's, it's, you have to take a kind of a holistic and a bit more of a diplomatic approach when you're sitting on the exchange side as a customer, I'm pissed off. Yeah, of course I am. I'm like, I just want to go and deposit my money, but um, there's there is a lot to it and a lot more to it than that at times when it comes to um, you know, that flow of funds. But um, yeah, we'll we'll be keeping our our customers and and everybody updated as things go. Seeing a lot of questions here, just about different alternative sort of blockchains, uh, Solana, Phantom, uh, even XRP. What I would say just about sort of alternative layer ones uh, about Ethereum. You know, ones that are like Ethereum. So I wouldn't, I would put Bitcoin in a different category, but I would say where things are at now is I would say probably the more successful Ethereum scaling sort of approach is the better they execute it, the faster layer twos come online and they are, you know, basically don't have as bad security trade offs as, as they maybe do today. Uh, probably the worst that would be for the alternative layer one sort of narrative. I think main thing I look at with alternative layer ones is do they have a unique sort of value proposition that maybe Ethereum itself or even the layer twos on Ethereum cannot really provide? Something like Solana, I would argue, still has a sort of a unique enough sort of value proposition where it has that sort of low latency, high throughput sort of use case that Ethereum simply does not have. Uh, that's why I still am particularly interested in Solana and do think it will be here for you know a decade and even more to come the other ones however i would have a lot more queries over At the end of the day they provided a very good use case in the bull market last last time when ethereum wasn't ready to scale so we saw the likes of binance smart chain polygon pos they were basically sort of you know more or less copycats of ethereum and even some of the other ones like harmony near protocol Phantom, they all essentially took off the pressure off of Ethereum and were able to gain adoption there. I would question whether that happens again. I'm not really seeing much activity or excitement around those sort of different blockchains at the moment. If that changes, I would get more interested, but the way it's going, I can't really see them uh, yeah, being around, uh, being a bigger part of the picture as what they were last time. So I'm pretty bearish on on most of the sort of layer one blockchains that are out there that sort of aren't Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Solana. Thank you, Maddie. Um, and as always, if you're wanting some more altcoin research, um, head over to Collective Shift. We've got that little QR code there, which I was trying to get to at the start. So you can um, you can scan that. That'll take you straight to our paid membership. Unfortunately, I didn't get to show you exactly what goes on there, but you can use the the code SWIFTX15 on any of those memberships. That would get you 15% off. Tom, I'm going to hand to you because I think we've got a little giveaway we're doing as well. Yeah, hey. yeah, we are. So after the webinar finishes, guys, we will be um, we'll be posting on our Twitter. So make sure you're following SwiftX on Twitter and Collective Shift on Twitter as well. Uh, comment 24, 25 words or less what you've kind of learned during the webinar, and we'll be uh, running that competition for an insider membership with Collective Shift up to the value of what's what's the value of that one, Ben? Thousand bucks, mate. Yeah, so thousand bucks worth of value there with Collective Shift. And two hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin from from SwiftX as well. So we, uh, Gina, and I will be jumping on to post that across socials after the after the webinar finishes. And yeah, I mean, just I guess a final thanks to everybody for joining. It's uh, it's been I've learned a lot myself listening to Matt, which I always do, and and Ben. So yeah, I appreciate you guys jumping on on a on a, a Tuesday night to get it done. And and uh, yeah, hopefully people got a lot of value from it. Yeah, thank you, Tommy. Thank you, SwiftX. Thanks, Matt. Always learn something from Matt every time, so that's always good. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Oh, that was good fun. Thanks for staying out, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Go, Matildas. Thanks, guys. <laughs>